In the early days of quantum mechanics, beta decay was a hot topic of research, which eventually led to the discovery of the neutrino as well as Fermi's theory of beta decay, where either a proton in a nucleus decays into a neutron, positron, and neutrino, or a neutron decays into a proton, electron, and antineutrino. The proton in this scenario must be bound in a nucleus, since the neutron is heavier than the proton, so a free proton decaying to a neutron would not conserve energy. So for a proton to decay inside a nucleus, the nucleus as a whole must end up lighter in the final state than in the initial. Now, we also know that these nucleons are bound states of quarks, and so we can switch out the proton and neutron for an up quark and down quark respectively, to instead deal with the Fermi interactions only involving the fundamental particles in our theory. Now, around the same time as the formulation of these Fermi interactions, another interesting particle was discovered from observations of cosmic rays. This particle, originally known as the mesotron, and later renamed to the muon, has the same charge and spin properties as the electron, but is roughly 200 times as massive. Originally, before the quark model, it was thought that this muon was another hadron, since it had a similar mass to other mesons like the pions. However, as the muon was studied in more detail, it was found that it does not share the same properties as other hadrons. It can't be classified into an isospin family, and it doesn't participate in strong interactions. So in reality, the muon shares almost all properties with the electron, aside from its mass. Another interesting property of the muon is that it is unstable and it decays. In particular, the muon decays into an electron, a neutrino, and an antineutrino. And in a similar way, an antimuon decays into a positron, neutrino, and antineutrino. This again exemplifies the connection between the electron, muon, and neutrino. In beta decays, an electron or positron is always paired with an antineutrino or neutrino. Here, we not only see an antineutrino or neutrino, which can be paired with an electron or positron in the final state, but also a second neutrino or antineutrino, which can be paired with the initial state muon or antimuon. All of this together led to the classification of the muon as a second charged lepton alongside the electron. So now, we not only added in a new particle in the form of the muon, but we also see that we need a way to include these decays into the standard model preferably in a way which can be useful in our usual perturbative expansion using Feynman diagrams. However, the issue is that just with the interactions we have introduced so far with QED and QCD, unless we have particle-antiparticle annihilations, we have no way of transforming one type of particle into a different type. Even worse, we have no way of including the neutrino into these interactions at all, since it has no electric or color charge so it can't interact with photons or gluons. The original way of including these decays is perhaps the most obvious. Just include new vertices into the Feynman diagram expansion whose external particles correspond to those participating in the decay. From the information we have, this amounts to four total new interactions, one for each type of decay. Now, on the surface, it seems that this should work. But there are a few issues, both technical and philosophical. The first issue is that this all looks a bit ad hoc, since we basically just added in these interactions because we needed something to explain the observed decays, whereas before, the interactions we introduced arose from symmetry arguments and conservation laws. Another thing which on the surface seems like a flaw is that these four fermion interactions turn out to be non-renormalizable, meaning that if we want to fully renormalize the theory, we will need to include an infinite number of additional interactions in order to subtract off all ultraviolet divergences. While this may seem like a massive problem, it can actually give us some insight into how to solve some of the issues at hand. See, non-renormalizable theories in and of themselves are not problematic. 
In fact, theories such as this one have a very convenient interpretation as effective theories, meaning that they are perfectly valid to use, and in fact truncate to a finite number of interactions, as long as the processes that we study stay within a certain energy regime. In this case, low energies. What if we want to consider high energy processes where the validity of the effective theory breaks down? In order to do this, we need a more complete renormalizable theory. We can get a somewhat hand-wavy idea how to do this from a perturbative viewpoint by considering the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. The standard Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle that many people are familiar with involves position and momentum. As the knowledge of the particle's position becomes more and more precise, the knowledge of the particle's momentum becomes less precise. However, this is not the only uncertainty relation in quantum mechanics, and the one relevant for this discussion is the uncertainty relation between energy and time. This relation has a few interpretations, but the one that will be most helpful in our case is that we can never know the exact energy of a system, but the more we allow the energy of the state to fluctuate, the shorter these fluctuations last. In other words, a system can borrow energy, as long as it quickly gives the energy back. The more energy the state borrows, the faster it must give it back. As an example of how this can lead to an effective theory, let's consider the simple leading order Feynman diagram contributing to a process where an electron and positron annihilate to produce another electron-positron pair. In QED, this leading order diagram just consisted of a single intermediate photon. Now, instead of a massless photon, let's consider an intermediate particle with a large mass. Without the uncertainty principle, this process can't occur unless the incoming electron-positron state has an energy greater than or equal to this mass of the intermediate particle. Otherwise, the system will not have enough energy to produce this particle, even if it's at rest. When we take the uncertainty principle into account, things become far less strict. In this case, even if the energy of the initial state is not large enough to produce the intermediate particle classically, the system can borrow energy in order to produce the massive intermediate particle, as long as the intermediate state does not last for a long time. The farther away the energy of the incoming state is to the mass of the intermediate particle, the less time the intermediate state is allowed to survive. This means that at energies much less than this new particle's mass, this intermediate state will be extremely short-lived. If it's short-lived enough, we can approximate the process by contracting the line associated with the very massive particle to a point and treat it like the intermediate state does not exist. The end result is an effective for fermion vertex, just like those which we've introduced previously to explain the Fermi interaction. Of course, we can go the other way and replace the four fermion interactions with processes involving a heavy intermediate particle. So let's go ahead and implement this in the scenario of Fermi interactions. We have to be a bit careful to still conserve the charges of QED and QCD. If we stare at these interactions long enough, we find that all of them can be explained by fermions coupling to a new massive particle with the same electric charge as the positron, along with its antiparticle, called the W plus and W minus bosons respectively. These new interactions are perfectly renormalizable, so this seems like a feasible completion of the effective theory. This new particle is associated with the weak interaction hence the name of the particle, though there are still other interactions aside from these which make up the weak interaction. In particular, the weak interactions involving the intermediate W bosons are known as charged current interactions, and are very key to the standard model due to their unique ability to change particle type at a single vertex. While the existence of the W boson was theorized as an explanation for beta decays and muon decays in the late 40s and early 50s, it wasn't until the 1980s when particle accelerators had achieved the ability to produce initial state energies greater than or equal to the W mass, roughly 80 times the mass of the proton, that this particle was directly observed. With this discovery, the W boson was officially added to the standard model, giving a renormalizable explanation of particle decay. However, this isn't the end of the puzzle. 
The W boson may help resolve the issue of renormalizability, but its interactions still don't seem to arise from anything like gauge symmetries, like we saw for the photon and gluon. This is a bit puzzling since it makes these interactions feel a bit unmotivated. Moreover, up to this point, the bosons associated with interactions have been massless. But not only is the W massive, it is far more massive than any other particle we have seen in the standard model so far. As it turns out, the W does in fact arise from a gauge symmetry, just like the photon and gluon, but the exact symmetry as well as how the W gains a mass is a bit more complicated than what we saw in QED and QCD. In fact, the properties of the W boson come from this gauge symmetry being broken. However, this is a quite intricate topic that will have its own video dedicated to it, so for now, we can be satisfied with our fully renormalizable theory of particle decays and our introduction of two new particles to the standard model of particle physics.